My name is Manish and I live in India. My work is around actively trying to resist and dismantle the global industrial education system and to regenerate um, local, wisdom uh, local wisdom traditions, uh, lo the local learning ecosystems, and um, self-designed learning processes. Um, I thought that um, I would try to uh, take you briefly, transport you to India uh, this morning to kind of give a context to my presentation. Um, and so I had two things in mind. Either I could play some bhangra music and have you all dance around. Uh, but I thought maybe later in the day we can do that. Uh, or I can show you a little video. Uh, this video is a little ad film that has been produced uh, uh, by Vedanta Resources, which is the world's, one of the wor world's largest mining companies. And it's in Hindi, but I will, I'll do a little, a little my, um, Something the Chinese have been mastered is dubbing. So you'll have my little translation dubbing on top of the video. So this is Binu, a little girl in a little village. And this is... This is her school. I go to school every day. Her parents probably never saw school in their childhood. These are Binu's two brother, brothers, Goshtu and Nandu. Their father had two brothers in childhood, but they did not survive. This is Goshtu's little toy. It runs by electricity. Her father did not have any toys nor any electricity. Binu has a lovely smile. I don't know if her mother had ever had a smile or not. Binu has, Binu has big dreams. Her mother and father have only three dreams. Binu, Goshtu, and Nandu. Every parent has a dream of their own. Binu, Goshtu, and Nandu. One by one, we are making these dreams come through. So this was a campaign on creating happiness that was, that's just been recently uh, out in India. And I think seeing this, we're all feeling really good and happy, <laughs> selling the lottery ticket of mobility, of choices, of security, of internet connections, and happiness to Binu and her family. But let me tell you a little bit of how Binu's story continues. This is from my uh, many travels in India. Um, and it's not based on a Bollywood movie. It's not a script for, for that. It's a real story. Uh, and it's a story that I've seen and also heard in many different places and villages that I visited in India. When you kind of ask a little bit deeper about what this happiness is all about. So Binu is considered to be a bright and obedient girl. She goes to school during the day and then to a private tutor. She does not have any time to go to help her parents in the house or in the fields. Uh, she no longer gets to go to the forests with her grandmother. One day, the teacher asks her to send, uh, asks her father to send her to town for further studies. Don't let her waste your life uh, like you did. You are a poor, backward, and illiterate man. Binu lives in a hostel away from her family and friends. She does not have time to come and visit for festivals, family events, marriages. She is not allowed to speak her local language in school. In fact, there is a physical punishment and fine for those who do dare to speak this language. She is required to wear Adidas brand uniforms in the school. And all of her school functions are graciously and kindly sponsored by Mako, subsidiary of Monsanto. She studies about the great green revolution, about the wonders uh, of the economic liberalization, about how the big dams are the temples of modern India, about the enemy that is Pakistan, and of course, about the IT revolution. 
She takes great pride in hearing that India is on the verge of being a superpower and that, ha and that she has a great role to play in its future. Her father takes on more debt to support her growing peer pressure induced urban consumer lifestyle. Cell phones, scooters, Coca-Cola, Maggie noodles, McDonald's, makeup. She gets admission to a prestigious engineering college. To support her expenses, she pressurizes her father to sell their family lands. She now knows that she holds the formula to happiness. More education equals better job, equals more stuff, equals more happiness. <clears throat> Binu gets a job and package in the IT department of Vedanta Mining and moves to Delhi. She doesn't know that Vedanta has plans to expand their mining operations into the Niamgiri Hills forest system where she is from. But she buys a nice flat, a nice car, possibly a Prius. Uh, and um, even gets cable TV. So one day after many years, her father, who is quite old now, decides to go and visit her to see how she is. He has brought a marriage proposal for her so that she can move back closer to the village. When he goes to her office to look for her, people are shocked to see him in his traditional clothes and turban, and he speaks the local dialect to them. He shows the secretary a piece of paper with Binu's number on it and asks her to call Binu. She tells him, there is no Binu. She has changed her name to Brenda. <laughs> yes, Brenda. Anyways, within a few minutes, Binu, Brenda, whatever, comes to the reception area. When people start asking her, who is this man? She tells everyone in public that he's not my father, he's my servant. Upon hearing this, Binu, Brenda's father, goes back home and commits suicide with deep shame. As I warned you, this is not a Bollywood story. It's a different, you may have heard about the farmer suicides that are happening in India. This is a different kind of genocide of traditional culture, of language, of community. It's a story that I've heard in over and over and seen in hushed tones all over India. And let me tell you a little secret. It's a story that I've experienced in my own life with my father and his mother. <clears throat> he became an engineer and moved to the United States and I witnessed him holding great shame towards my illiterate, quote unquote, illiterate grandmother, towards our local language, towards the use of his hands, towards his community. It's also a strange irony that it is my story growing up in the United States, that when I used to go to school here, I had great embarrassment whenever my parents would come out to me with me to school for events. My mother wearing her sari. And it was at this time that I started asking in my life, what, is the, what does it mean to be a winner in this system? <clears throat> but my story has an interesting twist, like all good Bollywood films do, <laughs> is that I went on to live for nine years with my illiterate grandmother. I, Virtually, I, you can say it's, um, I attended my own version of Vandana Shiva's grandmother's university. <laughs> um, are you flashing anything at me? Oh, oh my God, one minute. <laughs> uh, so that had opened a whole new vision of localization for me, that experience. I learned that localization wasn't about PowerPoint presentations, wasn't about research in the UN, it was about being, and how we are, how we are in our being in the world. And it helped um, trigger my own unlearning journey about what education was and what my conditioned mind was. 
And for the fa last 14 years, I've been trying to dedicate myself to understanding Gandhi's idea of Swaraj, something Sulak mentioned. And um, in that, uh, Swaraj means rule over the self, kind of the dance between autonomy and conviviality, about counter development, dismantling the industrial military machine, and also about the beauty of localization. As you said, resistance and regeneration. So I'm going to take one more minute. Uh, just to, so I think the thing is, I was asked to speak about education. I hope you got kind of the gist of the story. And what I want to say is that there's a lot of, I would like to, you know, uh, just I forgot to add, um, there's a lot of well-intentioned educators out there. I was one of them. See, education as a panacea is a great hope, as the solution to the environmental crisis, to the AIDS crisis, to the financial crisis. And for me, I started to realize that factory schooling and education is the essential vehicle for control, for colonization, for globalization, for building the industrial military culture. And it does that through direct forms of indoctrination. It does that through intellectual and moral intimidation. It does that through humiliation of local people and local cultures. It's been a Trojan horse for many social movements. It's the way to get the foot into the door of the global economy. Um, it's been uh, talked about the other night, something, uh, I think the, the downfall of the feminist movement. Um, and I wanted to say that I d deeply appreciate, there's many forms of resistance that are happening also to the education system within the schools. Uh, service projects, school gardens, nature camps, mindfulness training, diversity workshops, visits to old age homes, even bringing babies into the classrooms so that children can actually see what a baby, real baby looks and feels like. But I don't think that schooling as a system can be fixed. I don't think that we can build a genuine movement for localization without seriously reimagining education. Um, and it's not just about adding on all of these nice things because there's, a, the, there's something that we've done a lot of work on trying to understand. It's called the hidden curriculum of education. It's the structure that's created. And that structure is essentially about, I just identified a couple of things that I wanted to share before I sit down. One is the hierarchy of knowledge systems. That textual knowledge, that expert knowledge means more than people's knowledge. Um, it's about the ranking and sorting and labeling of human beings in that hierarchy. The failing of millions of innocent children. Um, the costs of winning also in that hierarchy need to be looked at. It's about supporting in that hierarchy a vision of technological utopianism. It's about creating this separate world of academic, academic meaning basically that which supports the global industrial economic system and non-academic. And this hierarchy is about silenc silencing dissent, dissent. If you don't have a degree, you don't have a voice in this hierarchy. The second thing I wanted to talk about in this uh, um, hidden curriculum is the commodification of learning. How we turn learning, one of the most essential parts of our evolutionary process, into a commodity, into a scarcity into something that should be bought and sold, as we're doing with all of the other commodities. It becomes a rationale that this is the way that life is. Nature is a commodity for us. Uh, yoga is a commodity for us. Play becomes a com commodity for us. Water becomes a commodity for us. So it starts with the education system because that sets the tone, that this is all about commodification. And it's also about ownership in that, that we believe that we are the owners of the earth. 
The third part of the hidden curriculum is the fragmentation of knowing. I know, your Christian's is giving me a dirty look. I'm almost done. <laughs> fragmentation of knowing. That we are producing fragmented beings on so many different levels. Fragmented across disciplines. Fragmented from our heads, our hearts, and our hands, which Gandhi talked about. Fragmented between adults, children, teens, old people. Fragmented from the land. And we live, start living a fragmented life, right? Work is separate, education is separate, play is separate, family is separate. And we start to accept that as the norm. And I see, see the traditional cultures, that's not the way it is. And the last two things I'll just briefly mention, competition, that my winning has to be about your losing. We start to internalize this whole process. And the last is compulsion, that people aren't intelligent en enough to learn for themselves without education. That there needs to be a centralized institutions which are managing and controlling that all the time. So I would like to just um, say that I'm calling us for to raise the bar around our conversations around education. I found that as I move around different social movements, different environmental movements, different localization movements have, have uh, been too, let's say, soft on the education system. And I think that we need to raise that conversation and invite you to do that. And in our workshop, I'll share a lot of the experiments, what we're doing. But one of the things is um, about talking about Gandhi and Satyagraha, so non-cooperation. So we're encouraging people all over the world to walk out of the formal education systems <laughs> and to become part of their own learning process, to create those in those communities with them and to enter into different kinds of unlearning processes to kind of start to remove this globalized mindset from our beings and to start to see how we are all deeper in, deeply interconnected at a mo more profound level. So thank you for your time. <laughs> <laughs>